Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that that word is very manna to our beings. You are the manna that came down from heaven, Lord Jesus, and you are the word. You're a personification of the word. You're the word made flesh. And it's you that gives us the motivation to absorb your word into our lives and to live by its directive. So we bless you for that this morning and pray that as we think about your kingdom and all that that means for us, it will be something that energizes us. It will be something that motivates us. This side of eternity, as, as has been prayed this morning, to be those people who represent you, Lord, with integrity, with credibility, and with faithfulness, just in the way that you've been utterly faithful to us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we're in a series at the moment that talks about enjoying kingdom, that's looking at kingdom values and how that we've been brought into God's kingdom through the atonement of Jesus, the kingdom of light as opposed to the dominion of darkness. Satan's area of activity is not a kingdom. It's a domain because he dominates. He dominates. He doesn't give you any realm of choice. He'll pull you into an area where you are entrapped uh, by lies and deceitfulness. But coming into Jesus' kingdom, we come into the light. We come into something that is, is too wonderful often to be expressed in words. But we never want to become over familiar with it. Never, ever. We're in the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God's son whom he loves, through whom we have forgiveness by his blood. The forgiveness of sins. And it's, it's an often an inexpressible kingdom. Now we've looked at various things. We've looked at things like repentance and faith. We've looked at giving, at prayer and fasting. These things which are elements of kingdom living. And we, we, we're still looking at these various things. And I'm thinking of the way that the kingdom is described this morning. And obviously my key verse is out of Romans 14, where he says that the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of eating and drinking. You see that in the context of what he's saying. It's not a matter of eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. These videos, by the way, they're, I'm, I'm videoed if you want to look... I haven't dared look at him yet because I, it's never easy to look at yourself, I'll tell you. But I will do it at some point. I'll pluck up courage and do it. Um, so, but but if, if, have you, if you want to look them up, because it, it, it's, it's a good way of, of keeping in touch with how we're seeking to move forward in God and um, what we feel the Lord is saying to us. And this aspect of kingdom has been very much in the forefront of the church is thinking, I believe, to an unusual extent in the last period of a year or two years. There's that Archbishop's initiative, you know, Thy Kingdom Come, which many of the Anglican churches and many other churches across the board have actually taken up to be more conscious of the kingdom than they are of church. Church, often for us, involves real struggle. It's a good struggle, it's a worthwhile struggle, it's a good fight of faith. But the more our perception is on kingdom, the more we will be buoyant <laughs> within all of that. And I've told you what the Lord said to me some time ago when I was looking, I put it in the news sheet this week. That wonderful Psalm 145, he said, you enjoy my kingdom and let me build my church. You enjoy my kingdom and let me build my church. You can't stop people who are sort of enthusiastic and, and have a sense of belonging and destiny and security. You can't stop them. They're infectious. And that's what we want to be, isn't it? Okay, so we've looked very much at Matthew's gospel, particularly since the, the real manifesto of the kingdom is the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus began his public ministry. We haven't looked so much at, uh, over this course of this series at John. And in thinking about righteousness, peace and joy, I just want to look at John's gospel 
a little bit this morning. And I'm into John chapter 16. John chapter 16, that wonderful discourse after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. 13, John 13. He's given them the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. It's one of the musts of John's gospel. A must. John's great in that. He doesn't give you any margin for for sort of swinging about or (laughs) it's sort of zero tolerance. You must be born again. You must worship me in spirit and in truth. You must love one another. You must follow me. You must follow me. The musts of John's gospel. And then Jesus follows it up with this wonderful discourse, John 14 to 16, before he prays in 17 for the disciples and for us who will follow on beyond of them. So this is, a, in the sense, an ongoing prayer until Jesus returns. John chapter 17. But you'll remember from John 14, 16, that it's essentially Jesus preparing the disciples for the coming of the Spirit. You know, I'll send you another comforter. It's good that I go, I'll send you another comforter. And heal the counselor, the paraclete, however you think of that. The helper, the spirit of truth, and he's going to be with you forever. Then he gives the lovely illustration of the vine and the branches. He prepares the disciples as they're going forward in this. The world isn't actually going to like it. If they hate you, keep in mind that they hated me first, so it's not going to be an easy ride. And then he goes on to summarize what the work of the Spirit is in chapter 16. So he says, I'm just going to read a little from John 16 verse 8. When he comes, Holy Spirit... Helper, paraclete, counsellor. When he comes, what will he do? He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. Righteousness and judgment. That's going to be what the Holy Spirit does in the lives of those who are being drawn to God through Jesus. He goes on, in regard to sin... Because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now that work of the Spirit is very, very important. Because when he comes, this is how he is going to operate Now, I don't know everybody in this room this morning, and it would be dangerous to assume that we're all born again. But if we are, and God's gracious intention is that we experience the new birth, all of us, but if we are, we will have experienced on the way through a sense of guilt. And many times... In the walk of faith that we have, this sense of guilt will come to us again. It isn't a one-off. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of things in life that are wrong. If we've never experienced a sense of guilt, it's a valid question. If I've never experienced that, it's a valid question. Am I really born again? You think of of those disciples to whom Peter preached the first Pentecostal sermon and he doesn't doesn't mess around. He says, it's you who nailed the Lord Jesus to the tree. It's effectively you who killed him. He he doesn't say I was responsible the way. He says, it's you folks. He's got his own, or has had his own guilt to deal with having denied the Lord Jesus though three, four times. But it's you. And it's, what does he say? They were cut to the quick. Because they realized their culpability in it. 
And then they really don't know what to do. Because they're cut to the quick. So Peter leads them to the place where they're able to respond and find the grace, the mercy of God. But they don't come to that place without being very made aware of their guilt. (laughs) Their responsibility. And it's like that, isn't it? As we go through the Christian life. And there's very pinpoints areas where he wants to move us on. That we'll have a sense of guilt. I have to deal with this. And the Lord will show us graciously how those aspects of our lives can be dealt with and how we can then move on. And if things remain undealt with, we're not actually moving on. Now, the, the way that the Lord does that, he doesn't leave us in a place of, of conviction. Of course he doesn't. It's like a child. I mean, imagine Rob's a child and he's doing something down here. He's making a real mess of what he's doing. And I say, come on, don't do that. I just get out of that corner. And, you know, I just tell him off and I, I do not give him anything in the way of help, understanding, or something to divert him into a useful activity. The negative, the, 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 the telling off, if you like, has to be responded to with a positive. That, come on, let's talk together. Let's do this together. This is going to be good for both of us. <laughs> Always. So it's pretty obvious. I mean, you know that. So we're not left in a place of guilt. Peter made sure that those here at Pentecost were not left in that place. What shall we do? We haven't got a clue what to do. But he told them what the way forward was. And so what God does, he acquits us of our sin. He leads us out of the courtroom, having exonerated us. But he doesn't let us leave the room without giving us a gift. And the gift is righteousness. (laughs) That's the gospel. It's the righteousness of Jesus given to the one who through humility and desire will be in a place to receive it. The righteousness. Paul puts it brilliantly, doesn't he? In the Romans. A gospel has been revealed to us which is from God. And it's a gospel is an essential gift of righteousness with this gospel. Now a righteousness from God has been made known to which the law and the prophets, they testify, they anticipate it. But this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So he gives us a gift of righteousness and then he says, right, I'm going to teach you how to put this to good use. I'm going to lead you in paths of righteousness if you will be teachable. He's going to lead me in paths of righteousness if I will be attentive to his leading. He's going to show me how to live with this gift of righteousness, which is a most incredible gift. The righteousness of Christ has been given to me and to you. And it's a way of the Holy Spirit showing us the positive and enabling us to live in the positive. Everything about the kingdom, I think Colin Urk had said it, everything about the kingdom is positive. The devil wants to swamp us in negativity. But everything about the kingdom and the ways of the spirit are positive. So the spirit will convict us in regard to sin by making our consciences guilty. And then he will exonerate us as we ask for forgiveness in the courtroom of God because of the blood of Jesus. And he says, right, I'm giving you afresh my gift of righteousness and I'm going to teach you how to use it. There's no point in being given a gift if you can't use it, is there? See, you've been taught how to use it. I mean, I've been living in sin all these years. And now I'm given the gift of righteousness. What good is that to me unless somebody teaches me how to live within it and by it? 
and through it. Conviction, sin, righteousness and judgment. And because of righteousness, the judgment is lifted off me. The judgment of God is lifted off me. The prince of this world now stands condemned. And I will not be judged in the place of negativity. I'll be assessed for the way I've lived, but I won't be judged and sent to jail. I can't be judged and then set free for eternity. Bless God. So that's that aspect of righteousness in God's kingdom. It's a kingdom of righteousness. And we walk in righteous ways by being part of that kingdom. And as we get it wrong, and we all have at various times, conviction comes back in and the process starts again, whereby the Lord exonerates us in the place of the courtroom where where we know we're judged. But he exonerates us because of the blood of Jesus. He reminds us we've been gifted with righteousness and he says, now walk this way because I'm with you. Now, He'll do that in the place of prayer. Jesus goes on, he's teaching them down this chapter, and he teaches them about the fact that as he is now going to the Father, as he is now going to finish his work, the period for him and for them is is a period of much anguish. And he likens it, doesn't he, to to the aspect of childbirth. Just before, when a woman is in the final part of her labor, it's anguish. I mean, it's pain. Do you ever watch Call the Midwife? I mean, I do at times, and I'm glad I'm not a woman. I'm glad I've never given birth to children. It really is anguish. But Jesus then says, that once the baby's born, it's all forgotten. And he, he, he's likening that to whatever... The, he and the disciples are working through at this point in time. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again. This is down in 22, verse 22. I will see you again. You will rejoice. No one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. These are fabulous verses, you know. <laughs> I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. They haven't haven't prayed in the name of Jesus. He was their disciple. He was with them. You know, they didn't pray in his name during the days of his humanity. You've not asked anything. But now you can ask and you receive. And your joy will be complete. Ooh. So the channel that's opened up through the gift of righteousness is the channel of prayer which we've looked at considerably over the last few weeks. And because that relationship with God has been restored through Jesus' atonement, we can now bring our prayers to him, know the way that he is answering those petitions, and our joy will be, as it says here, complete. So we've got the joy of restored relationship. Then as Jesus goes on through the chapter, what he emphasizes is, and he's already spoken to the disciples about it as he talked to them over this whole length of his discourse. He says, my peace I'm leaving with you. I'm giving it to you. It's not as the world gives. We can't function on worldly terms. We can only function on his terms as he gives us his gifts. Righteousness, peace, and joy are gifts. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. So he says that in the early part of his talk with them. They're sitting around and he's just talking. Seemingly had lib, but he knows every verse he's going to speak. Every word he's going to speak. Because he's speaking them straight from Father's heart. Then at the end of the piece, he says, I've told these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. That's par for the course. Let's get that fixed in our minds. Trouble, the early versions say tribulation, 
it's pretty much par for the course whether we are believers or not. But because we're believers, Jesus has said, take heart, overcome the world. I've overcome it, and you are going to overcome it too because of righteousness, peace, and joy. So we've dealt with those three facets, hasn't he, in this final chapter. The righteousness with which we're given when we come and find that in Jesus our guilt has been lifted away by the power of his shed blood and finished work on the cross. We're given the gift of righteousness. Negativity and judgment has been lifted off us. We're no longer in condemnation. Yeah? We've got a prayer link established through restored relationship which gives us holy joy. And the outcome of that is peace with God. And that's what Jesus teaches his disciples just before he goes to the cross. And these words are of utmost significance because when you really want people to remember something, when you're going to be separated from them, your final words are of incredible significance to those people. Aren't they? Righteousness peace and joy now Paul describes the kingdom in exactly the same terms in his letter to the Romans but let's remember he's writing in a totally different context Jesus is speaking to the disciples here in a time of real foreboding he's going to the cross but the disciples haven't understood that yet They don't really know what's going on. They just know that there is pressure in this situation. You imagine being there at this occasion around the Last Supper at the Passover. And you do not know actually what is going to happen. But you know that whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. It's dynamite. It's the biggest event in the salvation history of the world is about to take place. And Jesus is speaking in this context to the chosen 12. So it's it's a time of incredible spiritual pregnancy into which Jesus is speaking. Isn't it? Now you you flick over to Romans where Paul is writing to the church there, he he hadn't been there at this juncture and it was going to be quite a a long time before he got there at all but he's aware that the situation in Rome is difficult say the least difficult he's almost got a church split in his hands you've got Jews who don't like Gentiles you've got Gentiles who don't like Jews The Jews have been forced back onto the Gentiles because there was a time in the reign of Claudius when they're all expelled from Rome. In about AD 54 he died and Nero became the Roman Empire and he decides after a year or two that these Jews are pretty good, you know. They they bolster the economy a bit. They're all sharp guys. They can come back. Nero wasn't a maniac for the first few years of of his reign. He was quite a shrewd guy. So he lets all the Jews come back. And all these Jews pile back into the church, having been away for some time. What happens? Jews don't like Gentiles, and Gentiles don't like Jews. Jews trying to impose their stuff on the Gentiles, and the Gentiles resist with every fiber of their beings. (laughs) And this is what Paul is writing into. He's got a church split on his hands here. This is the nitty gritty of church life. Imagine how different this is from when Jesus is speaking to the disciples in John chapter 16. But he's he's exhorting, it's it's a lovely chapter, I love Romans 14. Where if you want to get legalistic and insist on things and, and try and frog march people into doing these things, whatever it is you're insisting on, read Romans 14. Because Paul is actually saying, come on, if it's not of first importance, give people freedom. Let them find their way. If you're trying to press Jewish legalism on them, it's not going to work. Give them time to find for themselves what God is saying and doing in their lives. And give them room to discover that. 
Don't give them a rule book which they're having to obey. So that's the essence of what he's saying. Whether it's to do with food things, whether it's to do with eating wrong food, whether it's to do with, you know, whether it's to do with the days that we celebrate and keep special. You know, over the years I've been here, I've, I've had, ought we, not, ought we to observe Christmas or not? You know, isn't it, doesn't it have pagan roots? It's not the right time to do it anyway. And to me, I just think, well, let's read Romans 14. It's not that important. Insofar as it gives us a good time, a good occasion, on which to remember the nativity of Jesus... Let's focus on that. It's not that important. But to say, you know, we shouldn't be worshipping at Christmas. Seems to me to be a bit irrelevant. I don't mind singing a few carols. Do you? I've cut them out about snow more recently. I can't see there's any snow around. I think that's a bit of Victorian stuff, really. Don't you? But hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. I can do with that. I can take that any time. <laughs> but this is yes. Come on, let's concentrate on the important things. If we're judging one another, it's, the spirit isn't in that. It's fleshly stuff. It's legalistic stuff. It's trying... To earn your salvation. Come on, you've been given it, friends. And we didn't deserve it and we still don't. I don't deserve to be here this morning preaching God's word to you. I definitely do not deserve it. Maybe you deserve to be in a place of listening. That's up for you to decide. But here we are. What does Paul say? I'll just read a bit. We will all stand before I'm picking it up midway through verse 10. We'll all stand before God's judgment seat. It's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, we've sung it this morning. Every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We're all going to give an account. Matthew says in one place, we'll have to give an account of every careless word we've spoken. And I think, whoa. Every careless word. Come on, Matthew, where'd you get that from? But if we repent of them now, then it's done with. So the Lord removes it. It just is a reminder that we shouldn't say careless words. <laughs> a good reminder. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. I just want to emphasize to you how different a situation this is than one Jesus was speaking into, just a 20 years before. Therefore, let's stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food, he's talking about food here, is unclean in itself. Enjoy it. If I'm understanding this passage correctly, we're not scared. We're not scared, are we? We're not scared. <laughs> it's great not being scared. <laughs> if anyone, but, but, but there is a, a rider here. I'm fully convinced that no food, no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. You know, if somebody says, I don't eat that halal stuff, well respect the guy you know because for him he, he really isn't in a place where he can take that sort of authoritative position and say it's not going to affect me, I'm going to cleanse this stuff in Jesus name I'm going to eat it and enjoy it because my Lord will make it nutritious for me you know he's in charge not, not Muhammad he's in charge 
If your brother is distressed, or we've often called it the law of the weaker brother, if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. It, it, we wouldn't eat it if, if he is there because it, it, it puts him in a place of vulnerability which he needn't be in. And I am doing that if I don't respect him. If your brother's distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Don't by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Don't allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. And here it is. Theme verse, friends. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If any... Anything, any awareness, any teaching uttered in the power of the Spirit was going to keep this Roman church together. It was that reality. The kingdom of God is not a matter of all this subsidiary stuff. It's a matter of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has given us the essence of that in John chapter 16. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. That's great. Thinking about good works last week, weren't we? Or the week before, we had a family service last week. The week before, thinking about good works or dead works. Well, if we're working out of righteousness, peace and joy, I don't care what the work is. It's going to be good. It's not a list of good things. It's not a list of sort of dead things. Unless the things are actually rebellious or, or immoral. You know, it's illegal, it's immoral, or it makes you fat. It's not a matter of those things. It's a matter of those good things being those things which you enter into because our hearts are after God. Our basic attitude and approach to life is Christ-like. It's righteous, it's peaceful, it's joyful, flowing out of Holy Spirit. And Paul us then, because anything who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. What more do we want? So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Verse 22. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith. And one of the most challenging things that Paul ever said, everything that does not come from faith, finish it off for me. <laughs> oh, there's only one thing that counts, friends, he said it to the Galatians. The only thing that counts, does anybody remember that one? The only thing that counts is faith working through love. That's kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. At moments of intimate worship and deep sense of divine presence, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. In the face of a church split, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. In the face of any difficulty, bring righteousness, peace, and joy into it. And you know what? You're going to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called thee. I'm asking a few questions because I can see a few eyes rolling. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Absolutely right. It's going to make you into a peacemaker. And there's always plenty of peace to be made. (laughs) Father, we thank you this morning for the precious word of Jesus. We thank you for how much he fed into the lives of those disciples, especially just before he went to the cross. We thank you, Lord, that how his teaching was fed into the early church and how it's still being fed into our churches now and how we've looked at it this morning. Thank you for your gift of righteousness by which we can indeed represent the Lord Jesus with credibility. Thank you that gift is accompanied by joy in the place of of fellowship with you in the place of restored relationship and peace in the way that we integrate with a world of warfare, of violence, of bloodletting 
and whatever else we come across, Lord God, we are people of peace because we serve the Prince of Peace and we love him and we await his glorious return in and through our great Savior. Amen.